All right, so uh, our next panel is about healthcare, and um, we're very pleased and honored to have Liz Harding, a uh, partner and shareholder with Paulsonelli, to moderate for us. Over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, I'm equally delighted to be joined by our panel here today. I'm going to do a really quick introduction of everybody. We've got um, Stephen Berger, um, who is president of uh, TEM Consulting, uh, Phil Englert. Um, who is Global Leader of Healthcare Technology at um, Deloitte Advisory. Erin uh, uh, Keneally, U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Erin is the Portfolio w Manager of the Cyber Division. Department Not of the entire Security. division. I won't take that credit. Oh. Uh, I'll, uh, three programs, uh, data privacy, um, data infrastructure, and cyber risk economics. And then we have uh, Shreyas Sen, who is um, Associate Professor in the School of Electronic Engineering and Computer Science, Computer Engineering at Purdue yeah, University. Yeah, ECE, Electrical <laughs> and Computer Engineering. Wonderful. Um, so we're going to talk about um, healthcare um, and the implications following on from the discussions earlier um, this afternoon on, on the issue of healthcare. Um, we're going to jump uh, right in, but just a couple of things to say first of all. Um, you know, we, we talk about the Internet of Things. Um, I think in the healthcare field, we talk about the Internet of Medical Things, the IOMT. Um, you know, that can range from pacemakers to uh, continuous glucose monitors to um, uh, smart monitoring systems um, that are in uh, swallowed form. Um, so there's no end of, of technology to discuss. Um, but starting with my first question, I'm going to ask this to Stephen. Um, so Stephen, what are the particular concerns you have with spectrum vulnerabilities specific to the healthcare field? And then what are the worst case scenarios? What are we not thinking of and what's keeping you up at night here? <coughs> All right, well, I I want to keep it interesting. Um, are we thinking enough and talking enough about our beliefs? Um, and there's, it goes into a number of areas. We all reflexively believe the past is the future and that what we will experience in the future is going to be a normal distribution of our past experience. But that's not necessarily true. There are non-normal distributions. There are black swans. Uh, Fukushima happens, the 2000 election, Bush v. Gore happens. Things happen with monumental impact. So when they happen, you have to bring a group of people together from various aspects and various expertise. And what I find in a number of these is it takes three to five years. And ultimately what's happening is you're coming to a shared belief system and a shared value system and then you find solutions that work in multiple disciplines and multiple levels. That's too slow. As one example of the past not being the future, if you look right now in the FDA incident database, the number of wireless interferences incidents being reported with medical devices is exploding exponentially going up. Mm -hmm. um, Patients are being injured, patients are dying. And, but as you start looking in closer, what you'll find out is the reason this has been going on for about two and a half years, the reason it's going slowly is those who need to work together on the solution have different values and different belief systems. And so they, you've got to work all that through and it takes time. So let me just leave it there, but. I think I can think of three quick uh, incidents where we've had these problems. One of them was hearing aid compatibility. Another was a problem with uh, portable oxygen concentrators that caused a lot of problems in this current one. And they all seem to take this kind of three to five years of a lot of thrashing before people effectively get working together. So hmm. that's, I'm not sure we're always going to have that three to five years. 
And that feels like a very, that's a reactive, that's the problem and then the, the fix, which I know is, is sort of human nature. But I'm interested from, from others on the panel, can we flip that? Can we look at vulnerabilities in advance? Do, do, we, do we have the foresight to do that? Before I answer that, can I, can I tee a little bit on your first, first question? Um, and I, I appreciate your response there. The thing that worries me um, with the medical device, uh, spectrum security is kind of twofold, and they're two ends of the, of the spectrum, um, no pun intended. So, so one is uh, we're increasingly moving into the, these, the W bands, so wireless uh, body area networks. So, so think of uh, the implantable device speaks to the wearable, speaks to uh, the data center. Um, and we're also living in this world, we, as we all know, uh, with regards to social media, fake news, our ability to trust the information that we receive. Well, what about this scenario where, you know, we proliferate these W bands and we've all got these, you know, these little wireless uh, body area networks around us that are connected to centralized servers. And what if we can no longer trust that information? Right, so that's a kind of a horror scenario to me in terms of information chaos. It's one thing to not trust in the news. It's another thing to not trust in the diagnoses that your physicians are, are providing based on the, the sensors and the actuators you know, within your body. Uh, the opposite end of that that I think worries me is this, this notion of systemic risk, and this comes up, I may touch upon it later. Uh, this comes up in, in the context of internet uh, infrastructure risk. Um, which is to say, you know, it, it's certainly problematic to have vulnerabilities and threats to individual devices, um, and absolutely if they affect life and limb, that's a huge problem. But um, when you talk about the sort of the complete um, healthcare um, monitoring system, uh, you know, groups of W bands together um, that fail, uh, I think that's something that we need to be concerned about. As we create, and this is the case with you know, IoT with um, cloud computing, we create these efficiencies. Those, these, all these efficiencies um, come with dependencies. Those dependencies lead to systemic risk and then eventually, um, you know, uh, cascading harms. And I think we need to be concerned about that um, as we build out these, these medical systems. Hmm. Um, maybe I would like to add an anecdotal story to it to talk about the vulnerabilities. So how many in the room knows about somebody by the name Barnaby Jack? <laughs> OK, the right people know about it. So what keeps you up at night? I want to tell the story. So Barnaby Jack's work, he was an expert in cybersecurity in medical devices. Between 2011 and 2013, changed the uh, threat that people think of. So in uh, McAfee Focus 11 in 2011, he showed with an insulin pump on his friend and another one on a desk that without any previous knowledge of the serial number of the pumps, he could hack into it with a high gain RF antenna and can keep on providing in uh, amount of extra amount of levels up to the levels that it is lethal. He then later showed that in 2012 at the RSA conference and also showed attacks on, uh, in 2012 on the pacemakers. Unfortunately, he, before presenting his work at Black Hat in 2013, he was, himself was found dead to drug overdose in his hotel room. Uh, so this is just a picture of him educating us what is possible and people were not thinking about in a very short amount of time because there are many people who know such things that can be exploited and may not come out and say it and exploit it at the right time. That keeps me up at night. Hmm. So, and, and, and that's a great example of purposeful exploit where somebody intentionally does that. And this was what makes the news regularly, whether it's a, a uh, implantable defibrillator, whether it's a uh, infusion pump for, for regulating glucose in your body, right? But the other element that we have to deal with is, is the interference that happens because we have systems in hospitals that are not mm. built and tested to go together, right? So we have things like, um, a, a noisy DC motor and a paper shredder interfering and leaving artifacts on an ultrasound image. You know, we have door closure systems that interfere with uh, the apnea mount monitors 
uh, for infants, you know, and, and items like that. So items that are not designed to be together, right, are not designed in the presence of each other can interfere and cause um, difficulties and challenges. So it's almost that development of, of technologies in a silo without a broader thought process about the, the kind of wider ecosystem in which they're going to be operated. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and, and these, are, you know, these are systems of systems. One of the challenges, right, we, we created this, this wealth of data that allows us to do amazing things in healthcare, right? We've got predictive analytics that instead of now where your physician will you know, try uh, uh, this medicine to see whether it, it uh, puts you into recession for cancer, right? Now they can look at your proteomics and your genomics, right, and say, no, medicine A is not going to work. We're going to put you on medicine B because we know you will respond to that. And we know that you'll respond with less side effects. And, and that kind of benefit that we get out of this interconnectedness and this building of these big, rich data sets is greatly beneficial, you know, but um, I forget the gentleman that says it, but another researcher, you know, with, <coughs> with great interconnectivity and in, interoperability comes great responsibility. Right. Yeah. And so how do we, well, why are we not doing a better job at identifying these vulnerabilities? What's, what's, what are the challenges to identifying these vulnerabilities? And then, you know, what can we do about them in the short and long term? Yeah. Try us. Sure. My answer to your first question is kind of more philosophical. Yeah. Uh, so security is always like that, that a group of people are trying to secure a system they are building, and then the whole world could break it with time in their hand after it has been deployed for the next 10, 15 years. So the advanced technologies available for breaking later and the sharp minds that are available out there that can hide and try to break it makes at the finding what are you going to protect against? You are only going to protect against things that you have thought through. Mm -hmm. What if you have, there exists a vulnerability that you haven't thought through, like you mentioned, that because of systems of systems are coming together. And hence, I think it is always going to be a very hard problem. But the things that people have thought through, we need to be extremely uh, prompt about solve, uh, taking countermeasures about those before we deploy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first question. On the second one, uh, what can we do about it? Uh, I have so our work I would like to point out here, and there, there are some other works also. So first thing one we can do is we should encrypt, right? There are still devices out there that are not encrypted. That does not make sense in today's day and age. But then you'd say, okay, symmetric key encryption, the keys are there in the device. One might do something like a side channel attack where you get the key out, and then even you can break encrypted systems. To that end, you sh we should start adopting public key encryption kind of a framework where you have only ephemeral key that you are developing for some time for, as a session key. Now, those are harder for, to do for resource and energy constraint devices, like uh, a pacemaker, or who doesn't have that much battery, because you are now trading off your battery lifetime of ten, uh, some n years to a shorter time. Mm -hmm. To there, there are better solutions for this subset of Internet of Things, which relates with the body. We are calling it the, we and others are calling it the Internet of Body, that exists a better solution by thinking ground up why are these hackable? And as it was mentioned in today's uh, primer, that radio signals are very hard to protect because the signal have to be available to everybody. That's how we communicate. But the fundamental question we should ask, that if I'm trying to communicate from my pacemaker to my watch, does the signal have to be available to everybody in the room here? The way we do this communication today is electromagnetic waves, where I will put my signal on top of a electromagnetic wave, radiate it, so that it goes through the airwaves, goes to my watch, for example, but also goes to everybody else. And then it becomes the, because the physical signals are available, the mathematical inscriptions can be broken with an intelligent hacker. What we are trying to champion is thinking of the fact that you can use the body as a wear. You have all of these devices on your body itself, and the body is conductive. 
So if you use the body as a wire, you can connect all your wearables and implantables for your internal body using the body itself. Mm -hmm. And then the signal doesn't go outside and anybody in the room cannot hack. It's only your signals are private to yourself. Mm -hmm. We are calling it the electroquasi-static human body communication because this is in the electroquasi-static range just before the electromagnetic range when the signals radiate out. I don't want to take more longer time, but what I'm pointing out is for the subset of int Internet of Things, that is Internet of Body, that is relevant for healthcare, there exists a better physical layer solution, which I am hoping standardization efforts will start, that can make signals private. So almost using your body as a network. Yeah, your body is your internet or yeah. network, or the wire for communication medium. Interesting. Thoughts on that? So, <laughs> so <laughs> I can't go there, right? But, but one of the things, right, is, is medical devices were designed purpose-built for clinical functionality, and they really weren't designed to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. They really weren't designed to even analyze themselves. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon, and I point this out to manufacturers quite often, that uh, I can turn on a medical device, and if it doesn't pass its internal self-check, it won't operate, right? But there's no protection to know that that self-check is actually run on verifiable code. Right? So, so they haven't thought about that. Mm -hmm. They don't data log, right? We could, if we log security events, right, and then we have the ability to use machine learning and AI to analyze this information and do and, and determine or identify things faster so that we can respond to them faster, right? Uh, that's one of the elements um, that I think is, is going to be very, very important, right? So. We talked about how difficult it is, right, because radio waves are out there and receivers are always open, right? And it's difficult to know whether your signal got to the right place or not. But think about, right, they talked about the exploit on the cell phone, right? If your, if your signal was, uh, if your phone, you know, downgraded, right, its service and it recorded that log and then sent that to uh, a, a central server, right, then that could be analyzed and say, wait a minute, right, 5G was available in that location, that was a spoofing attack, and we could begin to do that. And then recognizing those patterns, we could then begin to build resilience and response and recovery into the devices themselves. That very same principle can be applied to medical devices as well, right, make sure that they fail in safe ways, mm -hmm. right, make sure that they're resilient and they can recover fast. I would just add, um, with regards to the, to the wireless body area networks, um, I think the vulnerabilities vary in scope based on what kind of tier you're talking about. So whether it's micro devices entirely within the body versus the in-body to the on-body devices like ICDs versus on-body to off-body wearables. And then there's the, the entirely external, which is kind of beyond the communication uh, gateways, but in general, and as commented earlier, I think the the, the major vulnerabilities with these devices um, is the the uh, the limitations, the constraints, the the power, you know, memory, um, computational constraints really impede the ability to to implement state of the art uh, uh, encryption frameworks. Um, key management becomes an issue as well, and then you've got issues like securing uh, protocol. Uh, where you know vendors are just not doing that. I mean, th we know how to do that to a certain extent in, in certain cases, but vendors lack incentives to do that, right? It's all about time to market. So we get into the discussion about incentives and how do we better um, you know, force their hands to make sure that security is built in. It's part of the design model of, of the devices. And then uh, lastly, uh, solutions or uh, paths forward. So. Um, yeah, I think building better um, battery capabilities for these devices, whether it be in-body or off-body, uh, is important. Developing, you know, the equivalent of what we're used to in the network world, IDPS, uh, intrusion detection systems for adversarial um, attacks uh, on these devices is important. Um, yeah, I th you know, those are kind of the top, top of the mind um, approaches to deal with those. Yeah, there's another dynamic that uh, I think makes a lot of sense, but it worries me a lot, and that is the um, developing of, a, of the application of a device. There's a lot of devices come on the market as they're not medical devices, they're health and wellness device. I'm wearing one, it's my Fitbit, you know, it tracks my steps. 
the requirements that this got qualified to as a, you know, track your steps, help you do a better job of staying in shape, uh, not that I'm doing a good job of that, but um, is one thing. But if you go on to, to use them as an example on their website, you'll see they're exploring how this can be used in healthcare. And they've got a Fitbit Care site, and they're going in that direction. Many examples of this where a device gets introduced as fairly benign, and then people use, are creative, and they find new applications. And suddenly, it's being used in very sensitive medical applications. But it was never tested to the levels that we would expect things mm -hmm. used that way to be tested. Um, it was not designed to that. And, and I, I see that progression a lot. I'm not sure how we get our arms around it, but it's uh, an interesting one. Well, you see it with, I mean, the Apple Watch. You, know, the you do, and the Apple Watch was a great example, right, where, where it tells time. But it can do your ECG. And I was just at a conference. This was amazing, right? There was a physician on board. There was somebody, there was another passenger that was having a, a cardiac event, right? And this physician took her watch off. They let her enable the Bluetooth on this so she could read it. And she could determine that this was not an emergency. And so the flight could continue on to its destination and not return to base and interrupt travel for 400 passengers. You know, so this is the kind of advantages that these technology operation uh, uh, opportunities present. Right? And on a one-to-one -one basis, they're such wonderful stories, <laughs> right? But when we talk about in mass, they can be very, very frightening, mm -hmm. you know? And um, think about the security, right? What, what security level was it originally designed to? Right, right. So Apple is interesting because the FDA is going through this, this change. How do we do this? The FDA's um, um, purpose is safety. They really weren't about security, mm -hmm. right? They really weren't about confidentiality or privacy, right? And they're beginning to see that these have impacts on the holistic health of people, right? right? And so now they're going through this evolution and they're building things. And so you not only have to build devices that are secure, you have to build devices for privacy as well, right? And like not, not every squash is a pumpkin, but every pumpkin is a squash you know, is how privacy and security fit together, mm -hmm. right? So security supports privacy, but there are elements of privacy that don't fit into security at all, right? And that has to be really well understood to, to really get that we're building data systems. I'm not building a watch anymore. I'm building an element, a device within a data system, right? right? And, and so we have to begin to think about how do we do that? You know, how do we build that? How do we make them resilient? Mm -hmm. How do we make them secure? How do we make them private? How do we make them so that they can recover quickly? Yeah. No, it's interesting. And to that point, I, you know, I always come back to this issue with the, the wearable technology, such as the Apple Watch, et cetera, and the, the, the information that that's gathering about you know, uh, your, your health. Um, you know, that's, that's also to the privacy point, that's outside of the scope of PHI with HIPAA because we don't have, you know, and as I look at this from, okay, what's the regulatory overview, you know, you have this whole bucket of data that in a different circumstance would be heavily regulated and protected and is, is really not at this point in time. So healthcare has an interesting dichotomy, right? If I go to a hospital, right, and I ask them for my MRI, and they put it on a disc and they hand it to me, right, that's perfectly acceptable. If by mistake they hand it to you, that's a data breach. If they hand it to me and I hand it to you, that's perfectly acceptable, even though the end state is exactly the same, yeah. right? So you're absolutely right. The policies need to accommodate, you know, the great variety of stakeholders <laughs> that are involved, mm -hmm. right? And, and um, I think require, you know, take modification into or be modified to account for that, mm -hmm. right? Um, if we think about uh, accountable care, it was really about, right, improving the outcomes, you know? So they said, let's connect all of these things. So what we had was unintended consequences of creating these super high value data sets, right. you know? Um, yeah, I have a friend that 
works in uh, uh, voting uh, and election systems. And he, he says, this is a field where you think about how you're going to solve the problem for a week, and then you think about all the problems you've created unintendedly uh -huh. yeah. for a month. And I think we've got the same issue is you do this, and then you've got to start thinking about what are all the barriers you just created as you protected privacy, where the data's not getting where it needs to, and you're now impeding the health care because you've created barriers to flow of information, and people on the medical team don't know what they need to know. So I agree. And it's interesting, right? Healthcare, really, if you think about it, this is a risk management challenge, right? And healthcare is nothing but risk management. It's what physicians do day in and day out. A patient presents, they analyze the symptoms, they look at the uh, treatment options, they determine here's the treatment that, in my opinion, will produce the best outcome with the least side effects, right? And that's the choice they make. And this is what we have to do here, right? So when we think about what is the function of the device, right, as we're thinking about the design and, and implementation of it, what is the function, right, and the ethics of whether we, can, whether we should, even if we can, right? But what's the function? Then we think about what is, what can go wrong with that? Right? So in a medical device, right, we can have a defibrillator that shocks right, at the wrong time or shocks repeatedly right, or doesn't shock at all. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, these are the things that go wrong. So then you look at what are the mitigations? How can I prevent that? I can have code integrity. I can have data integrity. Hmm. Right? I can have alerting if my battery discharges right, to a point that it won't deliver the therapy that's expected. Right? And then I have to test those mitigations to determine whether they're effective. Right? It's risk management. It's a challenge because, as Stephen alluded to, you think about all the problems that can be out there. Right? And it seems endless. But if we don't start somewhere, we won't get anywhere. Right. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, on the backs of all these uh, comments that you know, solution interventions for this type of collective risk, because that's what we're talking about here is collective risk, um, in, a, in an environment where, you know, we've got a lot of information asymmetries, there's a lot of uh, unknown knowns and unknown unknowns, and we've also got a marketplace where there's really not a great demand signal, right? So all those, you know, are, are you know, combined to make this uh, perfectly situated for, uh, pre-competitive R&D tasking. I think we need a lot more thrown um, at these issues, at these unknown unknowns, collateral uh, or unintended consequences um, on the backs of research and development. Um, and I think there's some responsibility from a government perspective, uh, certainly, to, to help bankroll that. Well, and that leads me to, to the next question. Um, Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Question two. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, we talk about R and D, and how how do we incentivize this? Because as I see it, and I say, so I say it as a as a, an attorney advising clients that often the issues of security and privacy are, are kind of the, the, the afterthought in the, you know, the product's about to go to market and I get a call saying, oh, well, we hadn't really thought about, you know, what are the privacy implications here? And um, by the way, it's going to market next week. Right. You know, that, so how do we incentivize? Do we, do we need a stick in terms of more regulation? Do we need a carrot in terms of funding? How, how, do, we, how do we do that? So I'll jump in on that real quick. Um, so if you think of kind of the major forcing functions on individuals and organizations, it really boils down to the law and the marketplace. Um, and I, I think of um, in the incentive structure, and, and uh, you know, I think a lot comes back on governments of all shapes and sizes, but you can think of you know, law, regulation, policy, and the ensuing liability that comes there, there from. Uh, that's definitely a stick, and it definitely causes organizations to move and move quickly sometimes. Uh, standards is another one. Um, if people want to do the right things um, and they're motivated to, oftentimes if there's not kind of standards to galvanize around, that could be an impediment. So it acts as an incentive as well. Uh, you've got things, as I just mentioned, um, R&D, uh, testing and evaluation, uh, pilots, 
uh, test beds, um, all that kind of falls under the umbrella of uh, pre-competitive research and development. And then you've got marketplace uh, mechanisms, insurance helps, uh, and you've got things like procurement. So I'll give you some concrete examples specific to this space. Uh, let's see. So. I, I might get to, to speak about one of the programs that, that, that I run, uh, and I'll just, I might as well just briefly discuss it here. So it's called Impact. Basically, I bankroll researchers and developers to go out and find and curate and make freely available uh, research uh, for cybersecurity, R&D, kind of writ large across industry, government, and, and, um, and uh, academia. Um, and so what we're, we're doing there is we're creating medical device repository um, of, of data, uh, risk profiles for devices. We also deal with a whole, a whole swath of, of, um, of other uh, cyber crime and cyber defenses and whatnot. Uh, people come to me and they say, well, why should the government you know, be funding this? We're living in this big data world, right? Like data's falling from trees. Why, why do we have to fund this? Well, it might fall from trees, but it's still got to be picked and sorted and trucked and filtered and bottled. And, and that is not cost free. Someone's got to pay for that. And pe unless you've done research and you've tried to roll your own data, you've realized the pain points there. It doesn't come ready to perform research to develop and test and evaluate um, of these technologies. Um, yeah, I, I think. Um, I, I'll leave it at that. I think there's some other some other aspects to that uh, as well. But again, oh, the examples real quick. DARPA has got a spectrum uh, collaboration challenge uh, going on right now, where they're basically paying two two million dollars to the winning team uh, to use AI and software to find uh, radio to help uh, automatically and dynamically manage spectrum. Uh, DARPA also has um, a nice uh, test bed for spectrum security. I think it's called Coliseum. Uh, so there's things like that that I think uh, can go far uh, in incentivizing um, um, addressing these issues. Yeah, pick up on one point there. Um, something I find happens over and over again when you get into these risk discussions. Uh, a fundamental issue of risk is what's the probability of occurrence. Mm -hmm. And when you get the potential consequences of an event and the probability to the place where the risk is acceptable, you move forward. The consequences are generally ag agreed on, but probability of occurrence is really tough, and especially in wireless. Um, and I think that's a place where the kind of research you talked about could be enormously helpful if a high value, highly trusted organization would say, here's what's really going on in spectrum, and then whatever we're worried about, here's how you can really look at the probability that this will happen. Um, I find that. Uh, a lot of times, that's where things get gnarly. Right. Yeah. And, and I think incentives to um, improve upon spectrum security um, greatly, uh, to invest in, in spectrum security, I think they greatly improve when you've got um, risk measurement and modeling capabilities. It, it goes back to the old adage, right? You can't manage what you don't measure. And you know it's a worn trope at this point in time, but it became a trope for some reason. There's some truth behind it, right? And, and we just don't do a good job uh, measuring and modeling the risk um, in this space. Certainly, we don't do a good job in in the traditional, you know, uh, internet infrastructure space. And this this is even newer. I'd like to add something to that. Uh, so uh, you know, the question is, who cares about security and who is paying for it? <laughs> If you ask a random person, they'll say, yes, I care about security. Are you willing to pay for it? Generally, no. I accept. I expect it to be for free, rolled into. For the connected cars and healthcare, maybe it's a little bit better that, OK, I might die, so I'll pay a little bit for security. But for the general IoT infrastructure, uh, people are not willing to pay for security that extra amount. Now, where you have to then think about the dollar value chain, where the vulnerable devices are often the end nodes, and the companies making those are make, making the least amount of profit. Because from one node, you don't generate as much value as much you do from the aggregated data. Mm. So the data aggregation companies, like the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, are getting the value out of all of these devices. But because these de device makers don't have that much margin, 
and they have, are under the pressure, they don't have the opportunity to test out everything. So I think they're going back to what C said and also the philosophical nature of this problem. I think there are two possible solutions. Uh, or that A, we have to hold the money makers accountable, even though they are not making the devices and not making the vulnerabilities. But eventually they are making money from these devices where the vulnerability exists. Uh, so to fix the vulnerability upfront, they have to put in the thought process. And they, in many cases, all of these companies are doing that, but more forecasting kind of what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Kind of modeling frameworks has to be developed so that you can uh, guess most of your problems ahead. And then whatever is known, we have to be prompt about adopting those solutions. So combine these two, you will reduce the risk space significantly, but I don't think it will ever be zero, <laughs> given the nature of the problem. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I agree with everything that was just said by, by all three of my uh, uh, colleagues here. The only thing I would add is that this is not just a, a problem of will, it's a problem of bandwidth. <laughs> you know, right now in the right. U.S., there's over 330,000 open cybersecurity positions in IT, mm -hmm. right? And so we've got to develop the human talent to even have the hope of, of having, you know, the, the uh, capacity, the resources necessary to um, develop, deliver, and support these into the future. Because even though we can build secure devices, the world is constantly changing, and we will constantly have to uh, apply resources to adapt to it. Mm. Do you think as a panel, and I'm going to throw this in here, that the consumer of these devices, the, the patient or the user, has an understanding of the risks? And do you think that there is an ethical obligation to raise that awareness? And would that drive... Um, addressing these vulnerabilities, or do you think it's it's a similar thing to you know we we not to berate Facebook, but you know we're privacy folks. We all berate Facebook for their privacy practices, and yet how many of us still use Facebook? So is so so the notion of uh, ethics as a forcing function, I'm a huge believer in. I've been I've done a bunch of work um, on that in the in the context of uh, ICT research. So um, if anyone here of the Menlo report in the room, at least one person, Dan, you should know this. <laughs> um, so, so, look, I'm a believer, I'm an attorney, um, and, I, and people disagree with me, but I think that we start with ethics. You know, what, what, what can we all kind of, look, we all know that we have different laws, we're never gonna have unified laws across the country, across this city, across the world. Um, but we ask ourselves, you know, from the, from the bottom line perspective, upon what can we all galvanize and agree is, is right and wrong. Right. And that's ethics to me. And if our laws are, are done correctly and codified correctly, they, they should be a codification of our ethical beliefs. Does it always happen like that? Absolutely not. But so I, I'm of that mindset. Uh, we're hearing a lot more about ethics um, above the fold in mainstream media. I think it's a great thing. Uh, it's still somewhat treated somewhat shallowly because people can't really define it or wrap their arms around it. It's a, it's a tough nut to crack. But, um, you know, you've got companies now talking about it, creating, you know, review boards and whatnot. Um, I, I think that's great. I think we need to move on that as well, especially in the, in the context of artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. What I worry about uh, is that ethics is being used um, as a foil uh, to maintain control structures. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be very weary of that uh, as we move forward. You know, there's a dynamic that fits in there, and I think we have to be honest to it. it it's often much more effective and cheaper to uh, advertise and market that you have a solution as opposed to actually developing a solution. In the area of disability access, um, there was a major company, I won't name the name, but under a lot of pressure from uh, one particular attorney general, um, they formed a whole department to do a better job of uh, dealing with making their products accessible to people with disabilities. They put seven people in that department, one software engineer, and six PR people. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> 
I hear that happen in security a lot. I, I, I do certifications in certain areas, and every company that comes in tells me they've got world-class uh, security. And I know enough to be dangerous, and it's laughable. But, boy, they're confident, mm -hmm. and they've got all the buzzwords. Uh, so I think that's a dynamic that comes back to the ethics of it. Yeah. Um, we've got to figure out how to cut the, through the hype more effectively. But, you know, Liz, th this was the case with privacy years ago, right? It, it was a hand wave. Right. Um, yeah. Until things like GDPR and CCPA come down the pike where there's real monetary um, stakes, and then companies sat up and said, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe we really should, instead of dotting I's and crossing T's on privacy, you know, actually implement um, what these controls are calling for. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. Right, right. So the classic example in healthcare, right, was HIPAA. HIPAA came out and it was supposed to protect privacy, right? And 10 years later, they came out with high tech. So they put teeth in the laws, right, to get people to actually do something about it. You know, um, it was interesting. Uh, and just a quick anecdote, right, back in 1989, right, we talk about the spectrum. Uh, an HD TV station fired up in Dallas, Texas, right? and took out the telemetry system at Baylor Medical Center. And it took them forever to figure out even what was going on and how that happened and, and how this could be allowed to happen, right? But the telemetry system was utilizing a space that had been allocated to television, right? And the whole industry had done it. The amazing thing is it took them to 2002 to come up with WTMS, the protected medical telemetry bandwidth, you know? so. <laughs> so it takes a long time to turn the ship sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Change is slow in coming. I'm conscious of time, um, and so I, I do want to open up questions to the, to the floor and, and open it up to um, student questions to start off with. Now that you've got burning thoughts. As they all leave. <laughs> Blake will actually point somebody out if they're all being volunteers. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way that you see the role of different government, like regulatory agencies, in addressing some of the concerns you brought up. And do you have any, I know you were just talking about an example, but um, specific examples of way things that they have been doing that might have been somewhat effective, or if they haven't been doing anything effective in addressing the concerns that you've brought up? Well, so I'll, I'll point out that, um, you know, the way the government traditionally works is um, we've got swim lanes, right? And swim lanes are, are usually assigned by, by, you know, issue topical areas. This IoT uh, spectrum has really challenged that notion. And so I think it's also a reason why, why some things haven't uh, progressed as fast as they, they should have because, you know, f folks aren't sure who own it. Uh, there's been a lot more work uh, in uh, developing more kind of consortium-based cross-functional uh, um, um, efforts within the government, which I think is the right thing to do um, in this regard. I, I, can I can I speak to? I know there's a bunch on the supply chain. I think which is an, an issue that runs across critical infrastructure uh, risk, and I think it's you know somewhat tangential to to Spectrum. Um, there's a there's a group out of DHS that's that's working on that. Um, certainly, 5G is a is a hot topic in that regard as well. Uh, I forget, was there a second part of that question? Oh, you know, one thing I also wanted to comment on. I know you asked the question about the government. Um, and, and it just occurred to me that, I, sorry about this, but I, I didn't answer this earlier in the, with the question of incentives because really you're getting at, you know, what can we do to drive this forward? Um, and I, I did mention this notion of procurement, and the government certainly as a, one of, is probably the biggest procurement of, of, procurer of technologies, certainly can wield and does wield that power. I know they're doing it in the IoT space uh, to not procure secure mm -hmm. devices, for instance. Um, on the private sector side, there's something similar. So I'll give you a specific with regards to, to uh, medical devices. So there's things called GPOs, group purchasing organizations, um, and they're member-driven um, um, 
healthcare risk management organizations. And there's one um, one of my performers that I fund is is Mass General Hospital, and they're part of one GPO that represents a hundred billion in annual purchasing power. That's huge. And so what they're doing is is they're with regards to the safety of of uh, medical devices. They're saying, look, you know, if you don't pass you know certain criteria. We're just flat out not going to buy your devices. So that's a huge forcing function. I think it's a great model to look to as well. So if I could jump in on this, because there has been a lot of activity, and it's beginning to gain inertia in its effectiveness um, there. So uh, in 2014, the FDA came out with what's called pre-market guidance and said, hey, manufacturer community, cybersecurity is a real issue. You need to start addressing it, right? And and in that, they set out some very basic <coughs> guidelines, the, the risk management guidelines that I, that I posted earlier, some of the basic controls. They actually looked at tiering medical devices. Uh, medical devices are classed from a safety perspective, class one, two, and three, right? One meaning that it, it's not really going to harm anybody, right? It might be inconvenient, might do minor harm. Uh, two can, can cause uh, some uh, damage, uh, uh, physiological damage. Uh, and three can cause catastrophic physical harm, right? Uh, and, and so they, they looked at tiering the medical devices in those that could cause harm and those that couldn't. And with the tier one devices, right, the higher risk devices, right, they said there's here's 37 controls that we would like to see in here. And if you don't have them, there's no exception, right? And because if you think about the spectrum of medical device technology, it's so vast, you know, um, and, and there's not one set of controls that's going to apply to everything. You cannot do that ubiquitously. So in the 2018 revision of that, they said, here's some headers that we want. We want to see authentication. We want to see authorization. We want to see encryption. You know, we want to see devices that cannot do multiple harm. So we want them to fail in a safe way. We want them to be recoverable. We want them to be auditable for security events, meaning if I patch a device, the device should know that it was patched. Uh, it should be able to tell you what's in it, what's the C-bomb, right, or what's the, a the, the cybersecurity bill of materials, right? What is this device composed of so that when the CVEs come out, the, the common vulnerability uh, exposures, right, when that comes out, right, I can say, oh, this Adobe product is in my medical device and I need to be able to manage that and respond to it. So they're doing a lot of, of really good things. Another effort that uh, they have, and the government looks at this as a public-private uh, solution, right, and manufacturing included, but they've formed the Healthcare uh, Coordinating Council right, that is looking at all of these, supply chain involved, right, so I'm working on the supply chain uh, thing that says here's how you can purchase devices and change contract language and evaluate vendors for whether they're secure. They're saying here's the common vulnerabilities that we find in healthcare and here's what healthcare systems can do about that, right, and they're telling manufacturers here's how to look at um, Here's how to look at risks in medical devices, and here's the kind of protections you should have to the mitigations to apply to those risks and vulnerabilities. So there's about, the Healthcare Coordinating Council has about 17 different channels. One of them is future gazing, right? Let's look at where technology's going, and let's plan ahead and see if we can't get ahead of the curve on that. So again, I think we, we took a long time to get the ball rolling, you know, but the moss has fallen off the rock, and, and it's beginning to pick up speed. There's one other thought I'd like to throw out on that, and at the end of the day, there are no organizations. There's just people. Um, I think I first met Dale Hatfield on the hearing aid compatibility issue, and when people can find a way to work together effectively, um, magic happens, and if they can't, it's painful, and typically nothing good happens. Um, so I wish I had heard this much earlier. I spend a lot of time working on how to build relationships and just go get to know people. Mm -hmm. And the organizations will follow. So. Let's hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think if we've got time for one more question. 
Um, thanks. That's uh, uh, oh, I'm Richard Bennett, one of the people that created Wi-Fi. Good overview of the issues with IoT security, internet security, and everything. But I didn't really hear anything that was specific to the radio layer in healthcare devices, except for the body conductivity uh, issue. So could you kind of deliver on the promise of the panel and tell us about a vulnerability that is unique to the radio layer? that affects healthcare. I can start with that. Uh, so till date, there are many devices out there, both pacemakers and insulin pumps, which use unencrypted radio communication, which means anybody around can snoop onto that data. If they know the serial number of the device, it's very easy to attack. But as I referred to the Barnabas attack, even without knowing the serial number of the device, you can still attack because you can listen to all of this. So radio layer is extremely vulnerable today for those devices which are unencrypted. And going for many devices has already, like he uh, mentioned, that uh, have already embraced that authentic encryption, authentication should be there. It should be expedited such that no device should exist. And this year, Department of Homeland Security and FDA issued a uh, uh, couple of recalls at least on those pacemakers and insulin pumps so that many devices were recalled. I think those activities has to be done significantly because these devices have tens of 10 years of lifetime, right? So if, you, if we don't recall these, and in the age where the exploits are very easily uh, deployed, th th this is a very vulnerable system. Now with that, in going forward, I would like everybody in the room and in the online audience to think why do I need the radio layer to communicate from one location to another on the body when the body exists as the medium? So in the long term, I would encourage people to think of the problem differently. When a where exists, why communicate wirelessly and send my information to some other people around? <coughs> Stop me. I'll throw out one other comment on that. Over and over again, when we find vulnerabilities with medical equipment, the built-in security of the protocol is turned off or inaccurate, in, improperly uh, implemented. Uh, so I, we see this so often. Um, it's not that the protocol can't be made secure. It was poorly implemented. Um, that's probably the easiest way to, you know, the 20 percent that gets 80 percent of the benefit on this, and then there's some difficult problems down in the 20%. I've got a quick question. So to your, to your uh, solution, which, uh, I mean, I think that makes sense. We need to move in that direction. What's the threat model in that situation, feeding people the wrong medication so that it basically you send an, an infiltrator into the body to, to disrupt the, or intercept or interlope on the community? Yeah, that's a great question. What is the threat model if somebody hacks into my last yeah. network? Yeah. They can imagine it's the insulin pump. They can keep on delivering higher and higher level of insulin dosage, sure, and up to a lethal limit. No, no, no. I mean, in your in your communication oh. scenario, solution, I should say, okay. not the current. I, see. I understand that. In, the, in there, what is the threat model? Sorry. So the threat model is your signals only stay within your body. It doesn't go more than one centimeter off of how, your body. How is that attacked? Yeah, the only way you can attack is is by physically touching somebody. You cannot attack sitting there, my network. Yeah. So I have my own private network. And now I just Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we've, we've managed to end on an up note. It sounded like we were going to end on a down note. So please join me in thanking Liz and the rest of the panel for a great discussion. Uh, we will reconvene at the top of the hour for the closing panel. And that will be directly followed by the keynote.